So you think you want to become a beekeeper or just want to learn more about beekeeping? Well, this video is going to go through the 10 steps that will take you from today to having a beehive of your very own. My name is Larissa from Beekeeping Made Simple and I'm a beekeeper of 12 years. So let's get into it. The first step to becoming a beekeeper is learning about bees and the biology. Here is your first two minute intro. Honeybees are very social creatures. They live in what we call a colony. Colonies vary in size from 10,000 to almost 50, 60,000 bees. This colony is essentially a family. You have the queen bee, which is the mother of all of the bees in the hive. Her job is to lay eggs, hence she is the mom of everybody. There is no father within the colony. He died while mating with mom. There are no grandparents. They're dead already too. Now the queen is having babies and these babies are either worker bees or drones. The worker bees are over 90% of the bees in the hive and the bees that you're usually seeing when at seeing a bee at a flower or stopping by your picnic. The worker bees are all female. They're daughters of the queen and sisters of each other. They're called a worker bee because they're doing most of the work in the hive. They take care of the babies, they cluster up, vibrate their flight muscles to keep the hive warm when it's cold out. They are gathering nectar from flowers, pollen from flowers, bringing it back to feed the bees in the hive. They are building the honeycomb. They're doing almost all of it. But then they also have brothers. The brothers are called the drones. They are all males and they are brothers of the worker bees and they are the sons of the queen bee. Now the drone's job is to mate with the queen, not the queen in the hive, that's their mom. What they do is they go out, they call them DCAs, drone congregating areas. Packs of males just hang out waiting for a queen bee to fly by. The queen is flying by on her own. There's only one reason why that happens and that's because she is on a mating flight. So when they see this queen fly by, they try their best to be the fastest drone of the pack, catch up with the queen and mate with her. While mating, they die. If they do not successfully mate with the queen, what will happen is during a time of not much food, what we call low nectar season, not a lot of flowers blooming, the worker bees will kick them out of the hive and they will shortly die within the next few days. Now we all know bees love honey, but why is that? Well, some flowers produce nectar and pollen. Bees gather pollen from flowers and bring it back to the hive, mix it with nectar, and we call this bee bread. And they feed this protein-rich food to the baby bees. But bees also go to flowers and gather nectar. Now, nectar is a lot of water, but a little bit of sweet syrup. They bring it back to the hive and turn it into honey. And this is the food for the bees. They gather uh, up to seven times more honey than what they need to eat. And this is in preparation for the times of year when there isn't a lot of flowers blooming, like the winter cold months. But this is what also allows the beekeeper to gather honey while still allowing the bees enough food to feed themselves. There are a lot of great places you can learn about honeybees. One of my favorite places is from the Bee Girl website, which is a free book you can download down below. I also have an intro to bees and beekeeping course that's just $25 that talks more about bee biology or you can learn from numerous books out there. The second step is to make sure you're not allergic to bees. It's okay if you swell up a little bit. You don't want to experience your heart rate increasing, itchy palms or bottom of your feet, feeling like it's you're having difficulty swallowing, your throat is closing up, or of course, anaphylactic shock. In that case, you cannot keep honeybees. It doesn't matter how much protective gear you wear, there's still a good chance at some point a honeybee is gonna get you. The third step is to make sure that you have a spot for your bees. You wanna make sure that one, you're legally allowed to keep bees in your area, and two, you have a place that they can be out of the way. You wanna make sure that they are away from the sidewalk, common areas, pools, bright lights, say from your house at nighttime, and any neighbors that might be getting a little bit grumpy about bees in their area. You also wanna make sure there's enough food for your bees. Rural areas are by far the best. That is because it takes one to two million flowers to produce enough nectar to make one pound of honey. And considering that bees on average need at least 35 pounds of honey to get them through a cold winter in the United States, that is a lot of food. Suburbs tend to be the worst for bees because although grass looks nice, it is a food desert for them. Cities are okay, but not great. And rural areas are by far the best. 
The next step is to get to know beekeeping equipment. A beehive is where you're going to put your colony of bees. There are a lot of different beehive styles and you just want to start with whatever is the most common in your area. In the United States, it is the Langstroth style beehive. First, we have our hive stand, which is what the beehive sits on. Next is the bottom board, which is the floor of the beehive. Next is the boxes, or sometimes people call them supers. These are the deep boxes and you start out with two of them. Inside your boxes, you put frames and inside the frames, you put foundation. This is beeswax coated plastic foundation. The deep boxes or the brew chamber is where the queen will be laying the eggs. So this is where the baby bees are. You'll want two of these boxes filled with frames. Then you have the queen excluder put on top of the second brood box and this keeps the queen from laying eggs in the honey boxes. Next you have your honey boxes or honey supers. These are not as tall as the brood boxes and this is where the bees are primarily putting the honey. Inside your boxes you will put a frame and inside the frames you put beeswax coated plastic foundation. Then you have your inner cover which goes on top of the uppermost box. Then you have your outer cover or lid which goes on the very top of the beehive and is the roof of the hive. Then you have your entrance reducer which is put in front of the entrance to make it a little bit smaller when the beehive is small or when there's not a lot of flowers blooming to help them protect themselves from any kind of predators that might want to steal their food. We also have a mouse guard. This is put over the entrance when it's starting to get cooler out at nighttime to keep the hive safe from mice that want to make the hive their home. The other tools that you're going to want as a beekeeper are a hive tool. This helps to pull out the frames and take the lid off when the bees have made it all stuck together with that sticky plant sap propolis. You're also going to want a veil to protect your face from getting stung. I've been stung up the nose a few times and it is a really terrible feeling. It can be just a veil, a veil connected to a jacket or a full suit with a veil. You also want some sheepskin sting resistant gloves, which I do not own, but good to have when you're first getting started. You're also going to want a smoker. The reason why the beekeeper uses a smoker is because one way bees communicate is by pheromones, which is a scent that they are releasing. And when a bee releases an alarm pheromone, this is to let other bees know that there is something going on in the hive that they should also be alarmed out about and they should come help her. When you have smoke in the hive, the other bees won't be able to pick up on this alarm pheromone if another bee was to release it. So it doesn't calm the bees down like it's some kind of drug. It just keeps them calm because they should have already been calm and it prevents them from getting upset because the beekeeper is now taking the roof off of their house. The next step, which is totally optional, but a really great way to see if beekeeping is right for you before you make any money investments in it, is to shadow a beekeeper. This can be by going to a beekeeping association and reaching out and seeing if anyone is interested in letting you shadow them a couple of times or taking an in-person beekeeping class. A lot of universities as well as beekeeping associations offer them. Your next step is to buy the bees. You have two options, a nuke, which is this, and it's like a little mini beehive or a package of bees. And nukes are a lot more expensive, but is the easiest way to get started and your bees will grow a whole lot faster. You can also get a package of bees and they're cheaper, but there's a little bit more work to it because a few days later you have to release your queen and it takes longer for the bees to get started. If given the option, get a marked queen. And this means that your queen bee is going to have a pink dot on her back and will, be make, will make queen spotting a whole lot easier those first few months. If asked the genetics when you're buying your bees, don't really worry about it. I tell people if given the option, ask for Russian, second option would be an Italian bee, but really most people are not artificially inseminating their queens. They're letting their queens fly out and mate with whoever she wants to. And so they really don't know the full genetics of the bees they're selling anyway. Whatever you do, just do not have your bees shipped to you because male carriers don't know how to care for bees and it is very common for bees to arrive dead. And most of the United States where you have a somewhat of a cold winter, you're ordering your bees in January or February, mid-February at the latest. 
It's always great to watch a few videos on how to install bees into your hive, but most farms also do a demo when you're there to everyone that's buying the bees. It's always great to buy two or three colonies. Most of the time when you get bees, one colony is gonna be a little bit of a dud, so it's always great to get two of them. And you don't really want more than three because then if you make a big mistake and all of your colonies die over winter, it would be better if you are only doing damage to three hives at the max. Now you're ready to buy your equipment. Check out the PDF in the video description, my seven steps to getting started keeping bees for a diagram of this beehive plus the checklist. Do not worry about getting an extractor until you've been keeping bees for at least a year. The next thing you're gonna do is learn about the role of the beekeeper and what you are going to be doing to help your bees thrive. What you need to do is essentially manage pests, the amount of food in the hive, the size of the hive, the queen, and help them protect themselves against invaders. When I say pests, the main pests are the varroa mite, the small hive beetle, and wax moth. When it comes to pests, the big one is the varroa mite, and you're gonna to have to learn how to monitor the varroa mite levels and put in a treatment as needed to kill the majority of the varroa mites. Now they're constantly going to have new mites coming into their hive and every so often you're going to have to put in another treatment. The best way to look at this as is that it is just like antibiotics to help the hive. Otherwise the hive will collapse or abscond and completely take off once the varroa mite levels get very high. What I mean by space is when the beehive is small, the, the, you're only gonna want one box. And as the bees start to fill up the box, you need to add more and more boxes so that they don't swarm off. When the hive starts to get smaller, you're gonna to wanna to take boxes away. And you're also gonna to wanna to help them when it comes to winter time coming, if you have a cold winter and help keep them warm, as well as have enough food and ventilation and absorb moisture because when it's cold outside and warm inside, condensation can build up in the hive and drip all to the cluster of bees. The beekeeper helps the bees when it comes to food management as well. In the early spring and when there's not a lot of flowers blooming, it is common for the beekeeper to put syrup, which they make from sugar and water, into the hive using a feeder. At the end of summer or when the amount of flowers blooming comes to a minimum, if there is excess in the beehive, then that is when the beekeeper can take food away from the hive. And of course, when the cold months are coming, you want to make sure you have extra food on top, either just a bag of dry white sugar or you can make a candy with your white sugar and water to put up top just in case they need it. Protection means helping the bees protect themselves from other animals wanting to take their food. A really common cause of a hive collapsing is because they are robbed to death by other honeybees. So it is important to make sure that you do not leave honey or syrup outside of your beehive, leave it on the ground because that is just attracting all of these other predators. The beehive wants to stay secret. They don't want other bees and animals and insects finding them. You also want to keep your hive elevated off the ground a good 18 inches to keep them away from smaller mammals. And if you have bears in your area, put up an electric fence before a bear attacks it so that they're not even tempted to poke around that yummy beehive. And of course, this part of beekeeping is really runs the gamut. And that is because some beekeepers choose to be more involved in their beehives lives and help them out more. And some beekeepers would rather leave the bees to figure things out themselves and let the stronger hives survive and the weaker hives perish. It is up to you to decide how, what the kind of beekeeper you wanna be. The easiest way to learn about all the tasks of a beekeeper, as well as have a mentor and someone that you can go to with questions as needed, is to take a beekeeping class. Uh, you can take ones in person at beekeeping associations, or I have an online beekeeping class, which includes mentorship, and you are welcome to email me as many times as you want to with photos and videos asking me questions. Your next step is to assemble and paint your equipment. You want to use some kind of outdoor paint and you just want to paint the outside of the equipment, not the inside. And then you're, that's it. You're ready to get started keeping bees. There's a lot of information out there. So if you start to get overwhelmed, like I often do, I get super excited. I want to learn everything. And then two weeks later, I just have a headache and I'm, I'm done and I need a break. If that happens, take a break. Remember, you don't need to learn everything before you get your bees. There's a lot you can learn in the process when you have your bees. This is 
of this guide is to help you realize what you need in order to get started for your bees and all the other stuff you can learn as you progress. Classes are a great way to learn. I wish I had taken a class because it would have saved me a lot of money and I would have had somebody to ask questions along the way and I probably also wouldn't have lost my first three beehives. I knew absolutely no beekeepers when first getting started. Uh, my parents aren't beekeepers. I wasn't even much of a gardener. I didn't do a good job keeping plants alive, but I kept at it and I eventually found somebody to help me out. And I now have an apiary with over 20 hives and have been doing this for over 12 years as well as also worked for commercial apiaries for seven years. So if I can do it, then if you really want to do this and are willing to put the time and work into learning about it, you can too. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a comment, hit the like button, and I hope you subscribe to my channel so that you are notified about all of my new beekeeping videos that will come up. See you next video. Bye.